Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about the Baroque in Italy and then a little bit about the Baroque in Spain. But first, what is the Baroque? It's a highly decorative, inner, orna <laughs> ornamental, and artificial style, and it originated in Rome with the work of artists such as Bernini. Um, Baroque artwork is often really over the top, it's theatrical, it's showy, it's gaudy. Uh, sometimes the buildings and churches made during the Baroque look kind of like stage sets. The word Baroque itself derives from the Portuguese and Spanish words uh, Baroco and Barueco, which are used to describe these large, irregularly shaped pearls. Because like the artwork of the Baroque, the, the pearls are shiny, they're gaudy, but they're also they're a little bit grotesque, they're, um, they're slightly deformed. The word Baroque was coined after the time period by art historians who found the artwork of the Baroque to be a little bit too showy, a little bit too gaudy, and they thought that it was downright deformed in many cases. The artwork that we're going to look at, especially the artwork of Rome is, and of the Baroque, is especially influenced by the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation was a movement um, uh, from the Catholic Church in response to the Protestant Reformation and against the Protestant Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation and Lutheranism emphasized simplicity in artwork, um, especially within religious artwork, and we saw in the artwork um, produced in light of the Protestant Reformation a shift towards artwork that was not religious in nature and that was relatively simple. Well, the artwork of the Counter-Reformation is exactly the opposite of that. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church standardized um, and revised political, spiritual, and structural issues within the Church, and they wanted the artwork produced during this time period to portray the Catholic Church as being very powerful, unified, not corrupt whatsoever, and sacred. We'll begin by looking at the work of Bernini, and Bernini is sometimes um, seen as being the sort of father of the Baroque, the founding father of. He was an Italian artist and architect working primarily in Rome, and um, he explored Baroque style not only in architecture, but also in sculpture. He most famously worked on St. Peter's. He created this piazza, which is this outside space that you see from above. Uh, if you look at it, you'll see that the um, church, the St. Peter's itself, seems to be flanked by these two sort of sickle shapes, these shapes here. This is what Bernini designed, and he designed it in such a way that when you stand over here, the perspective of these two arms uh, makes the church itself appear slightly larger. And as you approach the church through the piazza, uh, again, a trick of perspective, it almost feels as though you're shrinking as you grow, as you get nearer to the church. Bernini was thinking about manipulating space uh, so that everything seemed larger than life, to exaggerate all forms. And again, this was all done um, uh, in uh, servitude to the church, to make the church seem even more magnificent, even larger than life. Bernini also designed the Baldacchino, the large structure within the Church of St. Peter's. So imagine, you'll walk through the piazza up to this church that appears larger than life, and then this is the, the centerpiece of the church itself. It serves as a kind of altar, and it's very, very tall. It's over 100 feet high. Each one of these columns is made of gilded bronze, so bronze that's covered with gold. And it's hard to see it from here, actually it's impossible to see it from just the slide, but each of the columns is covered in magnificent detail, including many hundreds of gilded bees. Um, the columns were cast in bronze, and they, they were hand designed so that uh, once casted they appear to be moving. Even though this structure is made of solid metal, it seems to have a kind of life and liveliness and an upward thrust that seems uncharacteristic of such a heavy material. 
The way that Bernini managed to manipulate material to make it look alive as though every inch of it is writhing is very characteristic of the Baroque. Bernini was also a gifted sculptor and he made many sculptures in marble. Um, the way that he was able to encapsulate movement within marble is relatively unprecedented. So we've already seen a bunch of sculptures of David. This was a, a favorite um, subject of the Italians of the time period. But his sculpture differs from the other two that we've seen because it's far more cinematic. And instead of emphasizing the nude male figure, the emphasis here is in movement. So when you walk up to the sculpture at first, you'll see it statically from an angle like this. But then as you walk along, uh, along it, you'll see that the story seems to unfold. And from some angles, the slingshot becomes more visible, whereas others, it's just the, the sway of the figure's body that you see. So it's almost like watching a slow-mo of a figure letting go of a slingshot. That's what makes the Baroque different from the Renaissance. It really tries to capture not only a sense of naturalism and drama, but a sense of movement too. And when capturing movement, the sense of heightened drama, of drama that's more real than the sort of drama we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. This is his, arguably, his most famous sculpture, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And it was a very um, controversial sculpture when it was first unveiled. You can see an image of it on the lower left within the chapel, so you get a sense of its setting. It's carved of marble, but as you can see from this closer up image, it's carved with incredible detail, and each texture is treated differently, so the drapery seems slightly shinier than the, the soft skin, which is a completely different texture than that cloud. She's supposed to be resting on a cloud there, which has been chiseled so that it appears to be light. And the whole, um, sculpture itself is supposed to feel as though it's floating above you. That illusion is heightened by those golden rays which in the church will catch the light of candles and seem to glitter. Why was this uh, controversial? You may have noticed that the, the figure of the saint appears to be an ecstasy that's not only spiritual but perhaps also physical. If you look at where the the angel is aiming his arrow. He's not aiming it towards her heart or her face. He appears to be aiming it towards her crotch. This is um, probably because the writings of Saint Teresa were sort of ambiguously sexual when she discussed the sort of pleasure that the contemplation of the divine awarded her. Um, but also this was a reflection of Bernini's own interest and he claimed to have studied the female face in orgasm when um, uh, preparing to sculpt this figure. I would argue that comments like that would maybe undermine the, um, the, the uh, desired effect of the Catholic Church during this time period, which was to prove themselves to be non-corrupt. Um, but I think it could also be argued that any artwork that is as lavish, as detailed, um, and as richly made as this is, is perhaps not the kind of artwork that emphasizes only um, divine contemplation, and that necessarily all artwork that's made out of such expensive materials and using um, so much human effort and time is also just intrinsically indebted to the material world. Again, an object of much debate that I encourage you to explore on your own. Let's look at some paintings by Caravaggio. So Caravaggio is a famous Italian painter. He was also a convicted murderer, said to have murdered a man over a tennis match. And he um, died in shame and mysteriously. Nobody really knows how. He is a master of tenebrism. And tenebrism is a um, it's, it comes from the Italian word tenebroso, which means shadowy. And it's the use of extreme contrasts of light and dark in paintings. He's famous not only for his use of extreme contrast, but also for the fleshiness with which he paints his figures. 
And although many of the images that he painted were very religious in nature, since um, he was paid by the Catholic Church, they also really emphasize our physical existence in this world. So I've got on the bottom there some dirty feet, or when um, picture when his pictures um, portray any sort of physical suffering, even if they're of divine people, the physical suffering really appeals to our our experiences of physical pain. So look at the way that those nails are really going into those wrinkled feet and the way that that's, that finger prods into what is supposed to be Christ's side. The people that Caravaggio used as models were often sort of um, poor people that he just picked off of the street, and there's a kind of freshness and liveliness to the way that he paints faces that I, I feel like is um, very relatable. We'll be looking at these two paintings. I've included this picture just so you can see how they're installed within a church. They're very large, and this here is the more famous of the two. It's the conversion of St. Paul, which is a famous biblical incident in which um, St. Paul comes to see Christ or accept Christ as his savior after falling from his horse. Um, again, though, this was an object that much debate because one of the centerpieces of this religious image that was placed within a church is the horse's butt, which is uh, protruding out towards the viewer. There is no mark of the divine in this painting except for the light. The light is supposed to represent his conversion, but many people argued that light was too weak a symbol for the divine and that this image um, hardly felt divine at all. It just felt like an image of a guy laying on the ground and there's a picture of a horse and of some bare feet. Um, but Caravaggio argued that uh, painting images that were uh, very much indebted to the real world and looked like everyday images allowed the viewer to contemplate divinity with more purity and was more relatable to the day-to-day. -day. Uh, again, the subject of much debate. And here is the painting that is installed right across from it, the Crucifixion of St. Matthew. Uh, this depiction of crucifixion is quite painful. Uh, looking at his his hand that has that nail running through it always gives me the heebie-jeebies. This painting again was highly criticized because it overemphasizes the pain. It's incredibly dark. There seems to be hardly any mention of the divine except for again that that light. Uh, and uh, remember, in the chapel, it looks like like this, so you're viewing it kind of from below. So what most people would have seen at first would be the very, very dirty feet of this man raising the cross, and then this hideously impaled hand. So we see an emphasis on uh, drama to the extreme with Caravaggio. Artemisia Gentileschi was a female Baroque painter who was highly influenced by the work of Caravaggio, and um, she's very rare as an example of a highly successful and innovative female artist during this time period. She was helped along in part by the fact that her father was a painter, so she came from a family that was very supportive of her talent. However, as a young woman, she was raped by a friend of her father's who um, was allegedly helping her paint. She, she fought against the rape and she spoke out about it and um, uh, much of her artwork, you can also see the influence of that event on her artistic output. This on the bottom is a self-portrait that she did as an allegory of painting. <clears throat> so I'm about to show you the painting that she did, uh, and the subject is Judith slaying Holofernes, which is a biblical subject in which uh, a woman kills a man by cutting off his head. But I want you to just guess which one she painted, and I'll give you a hint. It's the one in which the women appear to actually be exerting physical effort to behead the figure of Holofernes, instead of just using the sword as a sort of stage set. It is this one, the one on the lower right. You can see that uh, neither of the women appear to be remorseful in any way, um, but they do appear to be very powerful and very strong in a way that the other images don't truly portray. 
you have a real sense that the women are committing this act with no hesitation and um, are, that it's actually happening. This is another one of those images that just sort of gives me the chills. Look at the way the blood is spurting onto her arms. There's a sense of realism here uh, that you can't argue with. I imagine that part of this was born out of her frustration with her own personal experience, but it's incredible that she was able to turn her own personal pain into such a incredibly powerful and successful image. You can also see um, the influence of Caravaggio in not only the physical heaviness of the figures, but that strong light. Uh, the light being the only source of um, mention of divinity, but it's interesting that that light would be bathing such a gruesome and violent scene. We were in Italy. All of that artwork that we were looking at was from more or less from right up here. So now we're moving down, we're moving to Spain, and we're going to look at Diego Velázquez. Diego Velázquez was a court painter for King Philip IV, and um, Diego Velázquez is arguably, is arguably one of the most influential painters in the Western world. So you'll probably have seen some of his artworks or heard some mention of him. Here he is, an image of him is anyway, on a Spanish stamp. Um, on the top is a painting by Velázquez. And on the bottom is a painting by Manet uh, from the 1800s, so some centuries later, and you can still see that Manet is very influenced by the type of compositions that Velázquez was found of. On the left is a painting of a pope by Velázquez, and on the right from the 1900s is a painting by Francis Bacon, which is a reinterpretation of that same image of the pope. Uh, this is The Drunks by Velázquez, also called The Triumph of Bacchus. And this is interesting because the central image, uh, the central figure in this image, is supposed to be Bacchus, the god of wine. And he is the man that's the most pale. Um, and he's surrounded by people who would have just been common peasants of Spain. The inclusion of peasants uh, along with um, a mythological figure was incredibly rare. This is one of the earlier examples that we see of it. And uh, this is just basically a scene of a good time. If it wouldn't be for the title, one could even assume that it was just a group of friends getting drunk. This mythological title is almost like an excuse to paint something um, that's actually far more common day. In all of the artwork of Velázquez, we see a kind of like tension or um, a investigation of the nature of painting. So for him to paint this kind of image was uh, quite innovative and uh, almost dangerous during this time period. Uh, he's towing the line by doing something irreverent, by including uh, scenes of everyday peasantry and rising them to the, or raising them to the level of the divine by making this type of an image. This sort of tension and interest in what an image actually is is best exemplified exemplified by this Las Meninas, also called the Maids of Honor, which is his most famous painting. It's really difficult to talk about this painting because there's just so much going on. As I mentioned before, Velázquez was a court painter, which means that he was hired full-time by the king to paint images that were uh, important to the court, and these were often portraits of people of the court. He was given his own studio, and this uh, painting, we have to assume, is a painting that was painted in his studio. This here is a portrait, self-portrait, of Velázquez and he's standing behind a canvas. These are some of his other paintings in the background. And he is a, he's perhaps painting these figures here. This is the Infanta, this is the princess, and she's surrounded by um, some of her sort of courtly friends and maids, and the, the dogs, the type of dog that was favored by the kings. However, if you look 
In the background, this appears to be a mirror, and in this mirror is a reflection of the king and queen. So is Velasquez painting a portrait of the king and queen, or is he painting the maids of honor, which, which is what the title of this painting is? We're not really sure. But then if you think about it a little bit more, you'll realize that it seems as though he's painting a portrait of you, the viewer, because you can't see what's on his canvas and he seems to be looking straight out at the viewer. Uh, there are lots of um, speculations about who these other figures are, uh, but like many of these other paintings, all of these details are up for debate. So this painting is very important as one of the first paintings that we see in the Western world that really uh, is a critique and an investigation of the nature of painting because it is so open-ended and so mysterious. And that concludes this lecture.